the lady with the white fan, please keep it out of sight. Thank you. This is the uh, sort of thing that many people in this country never believed happened on tennis courts abroad. And they never certainly, I'm sure, thought they'd ever see it at Wimbledon. The 1976 Davis Cup tie between Great Britain and Italy. The day of the doubles after two Italian successes in the singles. The day every Italian waiter, it seemed, had left his table. The day of the Lloyd brothers. That, that was the key match uh, for where I really realised about spirit and, and will to win uh, because we were out of it. I mean, Panetta and Bertolucci were one of the top uh, ten, uh, doubles teams in the world at that time. And we were getting hammered. We looked like we were going to be off the court in three straight sets. I honestly thought we were inside myself. I remember thinking, well, this is a disaster. We're going to be out 3-0 on grass. And, and I've blown two matches. And, and David kept, you know, the changeover saying, no, 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 we're going to win this. And I'd miss a couple of balls and drop my head. And he would come up and say, you know, ah, get, the, get the thing over, you know, come on, make it play, you know, do something. Wow. <laughs> Going to Great Britain. Five games to four. Great Britain leads fourth set. At tenth game. Uh, you have three set points, they have five break points, and finally they get it. Now, surely then you must have thought, not going to be. No, I, it's one thing, I wasn't a very good player, but I never felt I could lose. I did. I thought we were going to lose that match from that point. And I think that, again, that was the difference and, um, in the attitudes. I thought we'd then, we had blown it. That was our last chance. I thought we had... Uh, We'd thrown it away, and I remember David keeps saying, G up, and I remember for a couple of games after that, I, I, I didn't say it to David because he would have probably hit me, but I was saying under my breath, you know, shut up, basically. <laughs> yeah, shut up, I don't want to hear it. From then on, the Lloyd brothers were forced to keep coming from behind to save the match. Indeed, to save the tie. gives Italy two match points. Thirty, forty. So it's still match point for Italy. Situation for Johnny Lloyd there with all the time in the world and making the right decision. Juice. Advantage Italy. So, match point once again.
So, Guilf in this game alone. Quiet, please. Three match points saved and one earlier. Deuce. Italy. And Bertolucci playing like a man possessed as he gives his uh, country their fourth match point. Hughes. <laughs> and interesting here, the British boys have changed their formation, both brothers on the same side of the court. The racket that's gone, they've knocked a hole in the racket, I think, of Bertolucci. Advantage, Great Britain. On court and off, the contest had swung. The dish of the day was now British. my fault because I was very mad because uh, David was returning all the time on my serve so I insisted to, to serve in his foreign to prove that <laughs> he couldn't return all the time so good and finally we lost so three match points for Great Britain They'd been on court for four hours. A famous victory, undimmed by the fact that the tie was lost. The British crowd love a British player. Greg Rosetsky's choice of headgear, though, was an added bonus. Since the public had been so supportive of me and behind me the whole time, I, I thought I'd do it as a gesture towards the public. And um, it was just a great moment in my tennis career, that match, and playing on court one. You had to win, though, didn't you? I, I did. If I, if I didn't, I think I'd be in trouble. <laughs> He's done it. Okay. Set, match. Rusetsky. Three sets to one. Six, seven. Six, four. Six, four. Seven, six. As Greg romped in, Joe bowed out on Wimbledon's number one court last year, losing to Jana Novotna. I, I wasn't sad, actually, because I was just so happy I'd made it through a round of Wimbledon. Here I was on a big court, the number one court, with such great atmosphere, so I was really happy. Everyone around me were crying their eyes out. <laughs> I couldn't quite understand why. <laughs> I was going to say, because you ran over to Alan, he's obviously been a, a big part of your career. You yes. wanted to say thanks to him. That's right, and I could only do it on the number one court, because they are right there, so I thought, right, I'm going to hijack him, so I went rushing across, and, and he, he was tearful, and it made me a little bit, but, I, you know, I was just happy, and I just wanted to say thanks very much. And more tears, perhaps, this year, as Jeremy Bates bids farewell. His favourite memory on that special court was a five-set marathon victory over Thierry Champion four years ago. And then, there was Castle. You can't underestimate the intimidation factor in here against the world number two, in any arena. Especially, you know, because it was the first match I'd ever been involved in anything like this. 
whatever you do, don't look at the crowd. It's like being on a on the high wire, don't look down sort of scenario. And I didn't look at the crowd until a little bit later on, as things began to dawn on me what was happening. The 285th ranked player in the world had set point against Mats Volander. That's when I noticed the crowd for the first time because they just seemed, it seemed like a tidal wave. Just everybody, you know what this court does, it just goes whoosh and it's just a tidal wave of emotion that came out of these people. I didn't even, I didn't realize, I mean, look, it's, a, it's one set to me, good. But for them, it was, I don't know, ridiculous, outrageous, and, uh, and they really helped me. Well, now, listen to this. The cheers ringing out up there. The young British fans have a young British player with whom they can identify. Philander took the second set, the third went to a tie-break. For Love was the moment. He hit an overhead, and I, and I thought, I can't believe he's not going to let that bounce. And the ball came just roaring out of the racket. It went straight down the line for a clean winner. And at that point, internally, I smiled. I was, no, I wasn't smiling. I was laughing. And then it, it just went on from there. And um, I mean, I remember he hit a poor return on one point, and I just went smack. And it wasn't an overhead. It was, a, it was definitely uh, a volley. And then to finish it off with six, I'll be changing ends and the crowd are loving it. And um, serve an ace out wide to finish it off. Game of Patrick Castle. I remember being amused that we were playing um, a fourth set. And, and, I, and another thing I can remember, sitting down at the end of the third, looking up at the scoreboard full of numbers, looking at it with my name next to Orlando's, you know, what's going, you know, is this really happening? And I just remember thinking, Oh, you know, I'm in trouble here. I remember feeling sort of vaguely embarrassed. You know, when the crowd really wants you to do something and you really, really want to make, to, to make them happy and to do it for yourself, and you just can't. Well, when the history of this match is written, they'll speak of the unqualified success of this chap's attacking tennis over the first three and a half sets. I still really wasn't aware that um, it was going to have quite the impact it had. I mean, it just goes to show how desperate the crowds at Wimbledon are for something, something excellent to happen. And by the time it had finished, I felt like I knew every single one of them personally. You know, just as they say thank you to you with their applause, you, you can actually say thank you very much. Others, too, have failed gallantly, but a privileged few can tell a tale of removing the number one seed on the number one court. 1963, the German Wilhelm Bungert against the Australian Roy Emerson. 